France has secured the support of Russia to tackle the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant as part of a grand coalition over Syria. The two countries will share military information about their air bombardments over Syria after both stepped up their campaigns recently. France is lobbying countries to back its campaign after 130 people were killed in a series of attacks in Paris earlier this month. Both leaders have agreed to coordinate, coordinate strikes on oil infrastructure ISIL is using to help fund its fighters. And the Russian President Vladimir Putin has indicated he's ready to support groups in Syria who are fighting ISIL. Well, let's take a listen in now to what both presidents had to say. We agreed today to reinforce our anti-terrorist work, improve exchange of operational information fighting terrorism, set up a constructive relationship between our military specialists in order to avoid duplication and incidents, but instead concentrate our efforts toward a more effective fight against terrorists and try to avoid strikes on those territories where military information shows that there are those that also fight ISIL. I talked about it to President Erdogan and Putin and it's vital during these times in this region to avoid any risks and any renewed incident and to prevent any escalation. The only sole objective that we must all have is the fight against Daesh, ISIL and the neutralization of terrorists. Temporary technical difficulties establishing contact with Rory Challens in Moscow to talk more about that press conference. In the meantime, we'll move on. With a similar, a similar uh, uh, take on that story, Turkey is continuing to defend the shooting down of the Russian fighter jet. The country's president has told Parliament its war planes took an automatic reaction to protect the border by opening fire. Jamal El Shayal reports from the Turkish capital. In his third public address since a Turkish F-16 shot down a Russian fighter jet on Tuesday, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan once again defended his military's actions. Speaking in Ankara, Erdogan said Turkey was forced to defend itself in this way after its airspace had been repeatedly violated in recent weeks. Earlier, Russian President Vladimir Putin accused the Turkish government of acting in support of ISIL. Erdogan rubbished those claims, pointing the finger back at the Kremlin and its ally, the Assad regime. Turkey doesn't need to fight according to the foreign agenda. We're seeing the same scenario as in Afghanistan. ISIL is an international game. They want it to be a tool for Islamophobia and racism against Muslims. In Syria, they use ISIL as a guise to attack the moderate opposition groups that are fighting the regime. The fallout from Tuesday's events not only risks damaging diplomatic relations between the two countries, but there could be severe economic ramifications as well. We have heard from Medvedev's Prime Minister Medvedev uh, saying that the uh, joint projects can be cancelled, can be affected. We have two main very big uh, projects. One is the nuclear plant, Mersinakri, and the second one was Turkey Stream. So probably both of these, those projects will be affected. Moreover, we also heard from Medvedev that the Turkish uh, investors, actually their share in Russian market, uh, might decline. According to this analyst, the downing of the Russian jet isn't the cause of the rift, though. The war in Syria has been a source for disagreements between Moscow and Ankara for some time now. We had many disagreement points like Syria crisis, Arab Spring events, Ukraine crisis, annexation of Crimea. They were all very big disagreements, but that time crisis management worked. Now what we see is actually de-escalation isn't important, but it's not yet uh, on the table. Both of the parties are not getting uh, quite calm down now. While the mood on Turkey's streets is calm and talking to people here, you wouldn't get the sense that the country is in the middle of a diplomatic standoff with one of the world's biggest military powers. That doesn't mean that the average Turk doesn't have strong opinions. After several violations, Turkey finally gave the response it had to. We showed that we are not alone and we are strong, but still our friendships must be considered. I think the government did the right thing, though. I support them, and so do a lot of my clients. This isn't our fight. This is a war between those in power. This is about those who support ISIL, who earn from the oil trade, who send weapons there. If there is a threat to our country, nothing else is important. Turkish youth always say this, and we mean it. Seriously, that's our mission, to die for our country. 
The coming days will be crucial in containing what could potentially increase the turmoil in a region ravaged by conflicts. Turkey's government says it wants to de-escalate the situation. But so long as the war in Syria continues, standoffs like these are more than likely to reoccur. Jamal al-Shayyal, al-Jazeera, Ankara. The U.S., meanwhile, says it will impose sanctions on individuals and organizations accused of helping the Syrian regime. Oil is now at the core of how ISIL funds itself, selling tens of thousands of barrels. Al Jazeera's Rene O'Day reports. Kirsten Alumzinov is a wealthy Russian businessman and president of the World Chess Federation. The U.S. government accused him of helping Syrian President Bashar al-Assad manage his money in Russia. The U.S. Treasury says it has blacklisted Alumzinov, freezing his assets in the U.S. and banning American citizens from doing business with him. The new sanctions announced on Wednesday also apply to a Syrian businessman who the U.S. Treasury accused of helping the Syrian regime buy oil from ISIL. Oil has been at the core of how ISIL earns revenue. Oil fields seized by ISIL fighters in Syria and Iraq produced an estimated 90,000 barrels a day, netting ISIL around $100 million last year. The U.S. government says President Assad has bought oil from ISIL to fuel the Syrian government's military campaign, even though ISIL is his enemy. In a statement, the U.S. Treasury said the Syrian government is responsible for widespread brutality and violence against its own people. The United States will continue targeting the finances of all those enabling Assad to continue inflicting violence on the Syrian people. The U.S. has attempted before to cut off ISIL's supply of cash by bombing the refineries ISIL controls. On Monday, the United States announced it had destroyed 283 fuel tankers being used to transport oil in eastern Syria. The Obama administration hopes these latest sanctions will weaken the Syrian regime and make a political and diplomatic solution to the war in Syria more likely. Rene Oude, Al Jazeera. While the latest round of sanctions targets a few individuals, a complex network of middlemen and companies is helping ISIL to make millions of dollars every day from oil sales. Political divisions and ethnic tensions in the region are allowing a black market oil trade to flourish. Elements of the Kurdish regional government in Iraq are accused of profiting from ISIL oil smuggling operations by turning a blind eye. The Turkish opposition has estimated that $800 million worth of ISIL oil shipments crossed the border from Syria into Turkey, with the full knowledge of Turkish military intelligence. Much of the ISIL oil is said to end up in the Turkish tanker port of Chehan. Both the Turkish and Kurdish regional governments strongly deny that they're facilitating ISIL oil, uh, oil sales. Well, for more on this, we can uh, talk now to geopolitical analyst Richard uh, Mallinson. Thanks for joining us. Do those numbers ring true to you, Richard? You were suggesting a moment ago that perhaps the actual amount of oil that ISIL is producing and selling on by whatever means is not as high as it's being made out to be and therefore not as crucial uh, a supply of cash for the group as it's thought. It's a really good question. It's something we've spent quite a long time looking at because there are lots of numbers thrown about, lots of estimates, very little hard information. And when you search down to the sources, very few actual original sources that are leading to these several million dollar a day figures. I think the reality, as far as we can understand, in a brief period last summer, large volumes over 100,000 barrels a day was being under control of ISIL being smuggled or being sold within their territories. That volume fell off very quickly because they lost control of some fields and because they simply don't have the expertise to manage and keep them pumping. So I think the actual amounts they're producing at the moment are more like 35, 40,000 barrels a day. The actual amounts of revenue, I think, are well below a million dollars a day. Still important, still worth disrupting to try and undermine the group, but just not as big as some of these figures and some of these claims that are circulating. Well, another big claim, of course, is this suggestion, allegation made by the Russians, that industrial quantities of oil are crossing the border into Turkey with the full knowledge of Turkish military intelligence, for one thing. Not the government, they haven't gone that far, but Turkish military intelligence. Is that a sustainable accusation in this murky world of middlemen and black markets? Again, I think, you know, let's see the hard evidence. Definitely there is oil crossing the border. It crosses in a number of ways and at many different points. At times, it's crossed in quite large volumes, but we've definitely seen efforts late last year, early this year, by the Turkish authorities to close those border crossing points to make it harder 
for the smugglers, similar um, in the other direction this oil is heading out. Question is, could they have done more? Um, could they be working harder? Probably yes. Evidence of how high up this goes, how organised this is, I'm not sure. I haven't seen that much that's really credible beyond the level of um, bribes to border guards, low level like that. OK, well, we're still talking about big quantities of oil, around a million a day, perhaps, in value to ISIL. Where's it going? Who's using it? What are the end, the end consumers? So the indications are it's going into lots of local markets, but generally black markets. So a lot of it is sold within ISIL-controlled territories. There are no alternatives for the civilians living in Raqqa, in Mosul. They still need diesel for generators, fuel for vehicles, uh, fuel for agriculture. There are suggestions and indications. Some of it's going into parts of Syria not controlled by ISIL, so going to the, peop the very people who are fighting ISIL. Similarly, Pretty good evidence some of it's getting into black markets in southern Turkey, some of it's probably making it through Kurdish territory and even into northern Iran. But I've not again seen anything credible that that's going into the official international market. I think it's being sold locally, it's being refined in makeshift units, and it's often reaching people who have no other source of supply. OK, thank you. Richard Mallinson, geopolitical analyst with Energy Aspects. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.